Welcome to the Bee Belt podcast, our local nature-related podcast. Focusing on our three counties, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, we'll be looking at what can be seen locally on your patch and also on what people can do to help wildlife in your own space. Welcome back to Bee Belt's podcast. This week, Andy and I are joined by one of my colleagues from across the border in Buckinghamshire, Kate Sheard. Hiya, Kate. Hi there. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, good, so good. Before we begin, do you do to introduce yourself and uh, let everyone know exactly what you do, where you're calling okay, from? Okay, so I will do. Uh, so my name's Kate. I'm the Community Wildlife Manager in Buckinghamshire, uh, usually based at College Lake Nature Reserve. Um, and I, the main purpose of my job role is to engage with people of all ages in Buckinghamshire to get them learning about wildlife and how they can help wildlife whether it's in their garden or their local communities I've kind of been doing quite a lot up in Milton Keynes so that's been one of my focus areas as well as young people Uh, and I'm actually calling from over the border in Dunstable in Bedfordshire uh, (laughs) from my little flat (laughs) but not too far from College Lake. Good, lovely. No, no, thank you. So um, it's become a little bit of a a tradition, I think, on on the pod since we started that we just go around the table and we share our sort of wildlife or nature highlight of of, of the last week. So uh, what's been your highlight of the uh, last week? Um, So I I actually went for a walk up in Milton Keynes on Sunday around one of their many lakes. um, And kind of the two highlights were actually just being by water because where I live there's we're quite landlocked there's no ponds or lakes or anything like that Um, so it was nice to be walking around uh, a different habitat and my wildlife highlight was seeing a male banded damazelle scooting across the the footpath Mm -hmm. over to the lake so it was it's metallic blue and the broad black stripe across its wing you know it was very very distinctive and then there was you know all the water birds some great crested um, grebes and lots of swans and geese with their signets so it was just nice to be somewhere a bit different after the the eight weeks or so walking around uh, Dunstable. Yeah I can imagine no they love it I, I really like the great crested grebe chicks the little like black and white sort of mint humbugs aren't they? Mm-hmm. they love it. And Andy what about you what was uh, your highlight of the of the last week? Yeah, my, my highlight was also a, a, a flying insect. So, uh, yeah, uh, it was a, a, a large red damselfly landing on my hat. I'm always wearing a hat. Um, so <laughs> this damselfly just came and landed on my hat. And I managed to take the hat off and have a much closer look at it. And it, it stayed there for quite a long time. So that kept me busy for quite a while. So, yeah, I think that was my highlight. How about you, Ed? Um, I think it's probably the bird zone. I know people have been talking a lot recently about, you know, obviously with the you know, reduced traffic noise, the bird song has become clearer. And I've really noticed, I think the last couple of mornings, I've just been waking up pretty early. So between about four and five and have the, the bedroom window open and just the bird song has just been incredible. Um, not own, as well, not just the usual garden species you'd expect. You know, sort of a, I think it was a blackbird that actually woke me up singing just outside the window, but you could hear a song thrush from sort of just, you know, a few gardens down and uh, sort of the Dunnock, but you could hear sort of the red kites circling over. I'm down in sort of South Oxfordshire, sort of Berkshire borderway. So we're lucky we've got loads of red kites around. So you can hear them mewing. There's a load of rooks in the distance somewhere, sort of noisily sort of cackling away. Um, and our row of houses, we're lucky we back on to sort of fields. Um, and he's just sadly it's a fairly intensively managed sort of agricultural land but it's still like old skylarks so i could hear old skylarks singing and is there a better collective now than exaltation of skylarks amazing and also corn bunting jangling away as well so yeah just listening to the bird song i think that was a real highlight it sounds like you're in bird heaven it sounds fantastic (laughs) you live in bird land (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 there's a try. I did, I did shortly go back to sleep. But no, it's a really nice thing to do, I think, if, if you're not up for getting out and about at that time of morning. Just sort of leave, your, leave your window open and just uh, wake up briefly and enjoy it for a little while before uh, dozing back off again. But today, um, what are we talking about today? 
Uh, well, I think on the previous episodes of the, of, of the podcast, we've been talking generally about how to encourage more wildlife into your garden. And I think if there's one feature that is guaranteed to attract wildlife into your garden, it's adding some water. So today we're going to talk you know, generally about ponds. And of course, they've become increasingly important as well um, as, as sort of habitats. Yeah, definitely, Ed. Yeah, I mean, ponds def- is, is one of my favourite subjects, I have to say. And, and as you say, as, as we've lost uh, a lot of ponds from the countryside, or they are unfortunately polluted, um, the, the garden pond is really sort of a stronghold for so many things now. Um, and it is just that thing of, you know, the opportunity to provide clean water for, for things in your garden is, is huge. And, you know, all life relies on water, as we've said in previous podcasts. So there's all sorts of things that will, that will live in a pond. So what I, what I love about ponds or what I find so interesting is all the different creatures that kind of the pond can support. So from the tiny bugs and insects that live on the surface, like the pond skaters to the things that live in the water, great diving beetles, snails, all those type of things, caddis flies, a lot of larvae. Um, like we both, mine and Andy, your wildlife highlight of the week were damsel flies. And uh, what's probably a lot of people might not realise is that the damsel fly larvae and nymphs and uh, dragonfly larvae and nymphs actually spend most of their life in the water, so in a pond. Um, they're one of the most ferocious predators <laughs> living in the pond, uh, go around eating everything else, but they can spend actually a year to four years living in the pond. And then when it's time to emerge as an adult, they might survive a few months, something like that. Uh, so ponds are really important habitats, um, for a lot of the insects that we see flying around, um, that's where they have their, almost like their juvenile stage. And they just provide, uh, you know, drinking water for mammals, birds, other things like that. So they're, they're a really vital source, whether it's out in the countryside or out in or in your garden. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I think a healthy garden pond, I think, is likely to support a granger, a great, greater range of wildlife than sort of any other feature in your garden. And so I think maybe you might commonly expect them is all the, the creatures you associate with the ponds, I guess, are things like sort of frogs and toads and newts, but you, you rightly say it's the, uh, it's all the other things that depend on, you know, everything needs water. Um, and you know, I put my pond in to the beginning of last year and to date, no sort of, uh, sort of frogs or toads or amphibians have found their way over. So, uh, it's really sort of bees that I'm seeing just constantly using it. So you're just getting bees and sort of hoverflies sort of buzzing around the surface and just sort of resting in the sun on on, on the sort of pebbles surrounding it. And birds, sort of blue tits, um, goldfinch, even a crow that comes regularly down to bathe. So it really acts as a, a, a magnet for uh, for a real range of wildlife. And I think as well, it's not just the water itself, but it's all um, the other bits around it. And, you know, you can really help lots of other creatures by, uh, you know, having, you might want to plant wildflowers around it or some longer grasses. Um, Quite a lot of the creatures are quite secretive. Um, You know, they want to be camouflaged and feel safe and have like lots of nooks and crannies to hide. Um, Ed, I think you were saying, about some of the other things that you could you could put around ponds uh for, especially for like the amphibians or the the toads and the frogs to kind of hide in when they're not in the in the water breeding yeah absolutely because again i think we i think you probably commonly think that you know th- amphibians are frogs and toads that spend their entire life in 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 the pond but they don't they only probably spend a, you know toads and newts only spend a small part of their life cycle each year in the ponds so they like you know, to come out and they find like dark cool dank places to hide so a really good pond needs some good supplementary features as well so as you said you've already mentioned sort of longer grass and some denser vegetation around the outside but also things like you know, log piles um some just sort of rotting wood um brash piles dead hedge you know, compost 
bin, you know, or, you know, or, or a compost heap in the garden, you know, places where things can feel, come and hide and shelter. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think uh, if people are, you know, considering putting a pond into their garden, you can get really creative with this. I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a, a variation in the sizes that you put in. If you've only got a very small space, you could use, uh, for example, an old washing up bowl or, you know, an old trug that you might have lying around and sink it into the ground. Um, you know, that, and that can be done in a very short period of time and it still provides an amazing little space. Just even a small amount of water is, is still brilliant and you can fill it with, you know, you can surround it with plants. There's all sorts of different plants you can get as well. I mean, it's kind of a, a completely different world, the, the aquatic plant world, I think. And a lot of people will look for really exotic things to put in a pond. But actually, if you look in, in our countryside, have a walk along the river, look at some of the amazing plants that are growing there. You know, sort of at this time of year, there's lots of yellow flag iris out. That's something you can put in a pond fairly easily. There's lots of different native rushes and things you can have. Uh, but there's also all of these amazing um, oxygenating plants that are floating within the pond as well, which you can have. Uh, they're a bit easier to, to control to some extent because they don't spread as quickly. Uh, but it is really important that you keep the pond oxygenated so plants will act uh, as an oxygenator. So things like starwort um, you can get, which is oxygenating. Uh, pillwort, uh, pillwort, sorry, I'll say that more clearly. Uh, willow moss, you can just literally drop into a pond and it will, it will spread. And as we've said before, that's another opportunity for things to hide underneath it as well. Yeah, and there's a really nice list um, if uh, you go onto Beebout's website, um, beebout.org.uk forward slash, slash actions, um, and scroll down. There's a section on, on how to create a pond. Um, lots of really useful sort of guidance on where to locate the pond, on maintenance, but also there's a really nice little list of um, suggested plants. So, so you've got a number of different zones within the pond. So you've got your submerged plants, as Andy says, which uh, help to oxygenate the water. Um, then you've got some emergent um, plants which um, sit in the shallower areas of the pond. Um, these would be things like uh, um, amphibious bistort, which is a really beautiful um, sort of native sort of persicaria. You've got flowering rush, you've got water mint. Um, and then you've got the, the marginals, to say again, uh, things like hempagrimony, um, which, is a, which is a lovely plant we know from one of our you know, the sites that we work on frequently in Oxford, uh, 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 Rivermead Nature Park. There's big stands of hempagrimony and the insects absolutely love it. I mean, it's just covered in insects, but you know, things like marsh marigold as well as in there and ragged robin. It's another of my favourites, which is, uh, I've got growing next to my pond at the moment. Really lovely or pink raggedy flowers the name suggests gorgeous little plants so yeah but yeah lot, lots of options i think with the pond as well it's not uh wherever you have it in your garden it's not thinking it thinking of it as a an isolated feature um it's like how does it connect and join up mm. with your rest of your garden um you know is there some longer vegetation where some of these creatures um can crawl in or creep in and be undiscovered by predators and things like that but um, you know obviously it's easier for, for things to find a pond if it flies um, and that sort of thing so um, like you guys were just saying about the, the vegetation around the edge um, some of these creatures will utilize it if it's a sunny spot you know it'll act as a, a perching post for a butterfly or a dragonfly mm -hmm. damselfly that type of thing but what what I think is really cool um, is that newts um they actually they just lay one single egg on a leaf and then they they actually fold the leaf into a little parcel a little envelope um to keep it uh, safe from predators and harm's way um so if you can add these extra features around the pond then you're more likely to encourage more creatures in to use the pond yeah definitely i I think it's uh, the other thing if, if, if people do put in ponds, it's important to be patient, isn't it? Because I think, I think you can kind of expect things to just come in straight away. And I think actually what usually happens is you have to think about the, the mini kind of ecosystem, don't you, in terms of there has to be food for things to eat. So often the first thing, although this does put some people off, 
is mosquito lava. They do tend to come in. And I get, do get a lot of people say to me, well, why would I put a pond in? Why would I encourage mosquito lava? And you have to think, well, that they are the kind of, uh, they're, the, they're the plankton, aren't they, really, in, mm. in terms of the, the, the ecosystem. So they feed absolutely everything else. So not only will the lava feed all of the animals that are living within the pond, that will then feed the slightly bigger things. And then you'll start to get the, the really fascinating things like Kate, you mentioned the, the dragonfly and um, damselfly nymphs. Um, I think working with kids every now and again, if you, you know, if you, you put one of those under a microscope and show them on a big screen, which we do at the education centers, the kids are just absolutely fascinated by these, these things. I mean, they've got these, extending jaws that, that, that just shoot out and, and eat things in a pond they can eat tadpoles i mean it's it's just it's absolutely incredible it's like this amazing underground sinister world isn't it that yeah. uh, that's kind of accessible to us you know if it, it, there's, there's ponds everywhere we can we can get out and, and look at them yeah i mean those dragonfly larvae are incredible aren't they i mean they are like you can see why they're called dragonflies i mean they are like these alien creatures <laughs> just there and absolutely sort of voracious predators and that's the thing it's just good fun again i was working in the you know up in the garden at the weekend just uh realigning the levels the pond started to i had been messing around the weekend before and i've managed to mess trying to create a little beachy area so i think it's really important with the ponds that you have a sort of shallower end um for, for not only for creatures to kind of get into the pond but also to get out um you don't really want to be sort of fishing out drowned hedgehogs from your pond when you sort of stroll out with your morning cup of tea. What I was going to say as well is that most of the time we say the best time to dig a pond is kind of like autumn winter time mm. but because so many people are home at the minute um, then you know I'd say if you if you're thinking about installing a pond digging a pond then do it now it might take a bit longer mm. to uh, the creatures to colonize so it, you might not get anything in there till this time next year or next spring uh, that i think that's the main reason why they say um autumn winter and you're not really going to disturb other things in your garden but i'd say do it now it's great you know you're at home um you know it's good good exercise good for being physical out there being outside especially now it's I'm just looking out of my flat window and the sun's shining. It's lovely blue sky. So it's just great to be outside at this time of year. And if you can do something in your own patch, your garden to help wildlife, then, you know, it's not, it's not only benefiting you both physically and, you know, mentally it makes us feel good, but you're also helping um, the local wildlife as well. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to just go back a, a second about being patient. I think it's really important. I think it should remind uh, our listeners to resist the urge to transfer, uh, you know, go and collect um, you know, tadpoles or, or newts from other ponds to put into your pond. In this case, sharing really isn't caring. Yeah, because you get you're, you, you, you're risking transferring disease or invasive species across ponds. So. Kate? Um, what I was going to say as well, it, it leads into the being patient as well, that it's oh. much better to let your pond fill up naturally with rainwater, unless you've already been collecting it in a water butt. Uh, rainwater is so much better uh, for both plants and animals. Mm -hmm. There's less uh, chemicals in it, it's less harsh. Where I live, it's really hard water, it's awful, it's full of lime scale and everything else. Um, so if you can, be super patient, collect your rainwater, let it fill up naturally, um, and it'll be so much better for the, the, the creatures that will live there. Absolutely. And, and of course, Kate, you actually don't have a garden as well, as well do you? Because we, we must be yeah, acknowledged that obviously not everyone has got the space or you know, the inclination necessarily to, to, to build a pond, or they might have safety concerns if you've got young children, etc. So any tips on how to provide water for animals in a, in a smaller space? You've got a like patio or you don't have a patio, do you? Have a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. my, my flat front door goes straight out into my car park. Um, so I've got a few 
pots planted up with uh, nice flowers that are good for bees and butterflies. Um, and they had some good ideas earlier about small scale um, uh, things that you can put in the ground that are quite small, uh, washing up bowls, that type of thing. Um, I think, you know, as well, if you can't have a pond, it's, it's also good to put out water, either like something like a bird bath um, or just even if it's a, a, a low container on the floor. Again, better if it's rainwater. I do collect rainwater to water my house plants. That's good um, uh, they're, they're, they're thriving now. <laughs> this past yeah. few months or so that I've been um, uh, watering them with um, rainwater. Uh, but we need a bit more rain because I've run out now. Uh, but yeah, you can just put like an ice cream container, something like that on the ground somewhere in your garden. And it might be that, uh, you know, you provide in drinking water for hedgehogs. If you're lucky, you might have a, a fox or a badger um, or probably I'm, I'm providing water for the local cats or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but th there's lots of like uh, little creatures and it's worth, putting some stones and some rocks in the uh, the pot in case those small mammals do get in um, and can't get out so it's it's providing that way in and out in case you know something slips in or falls in but you know it's good to provide that drinking water for birds and mammals yeah. And this goes back, I think, in previous um, episodes of, of, of the pod, we talked about yeah, even though the space that you have or what you can do on its own, it might, you know, might not see much. You might either literally or comparatively might have a fairly small garden, but combined you know, together, it can have a hu huge impact. Yeah, definitely. It just it comes back to exactly what you said, Ed. It's, it's all about connectivity, isn't it? And and you know something that you can do if you if you live in a if you live in some flats or if you are in an estate and and you can maybe inspire your neighbours to you know just have some water in their garden um, is so so important. Um, one of the questions we get quite a lot, so people email us um, about ponds quite frequently actually, is what do you do if the pond dries out? Now I think people do get a bit concerned about that, but you have to you have to kind of remember. Uh, that in the countryside we do have lots of seasonal ponds most creatures are amazingly adaptable and have adapted to the seasonal drying out of ponds this is i think this has been one of the driest maze on record which is obviously mm. quite concerning for some people who do have ponds um but that's that's why you can you know if you can have a water butt somewhere to to uh, have an, as a as a top up if you want to top up top up your pond um, then that you know helps with the anxiety around the, the creatures in the pond but most of them will be absolutely fine and can survive in the in the wet mud at the bottom of the pond so it's just something to consider really before you go and get the hose out and fill it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah and obviously conserving rainwater is pretty good practice anyway isn't it so it's uh, to you know, recycle that water and as a, a, another interesting thing as well we talk about providing habitat um, and um, there's some really interesting research came out last year, I think it was Northumbria University as well. And although I think it can be quite tricky to measure, um, the, the long term research conducted by Northumbria University suggested that ponds can potentially absorb more carbon than woodland, which means that your pond can also help fight climate breakdown in your garden. Um, I think it's a reminder that I know, I think there's a huge focus um, over the last couple of years on, on, on tree planting and obviously the right trees in the right place can be hugely beneficial. Um, but it's not the only solution available. And I think our wetlands, whether we're talking about you know, marshes or fens or upland peat bogs um, and our ponds can potentially have a huge role to play in uh, um, in helping us fight climate breakdown as well. Just moving on from that, Ed, um, one thing that we can do as a consumer, as a gardener, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's about our actions and our choices and decisions. And yes, it is more expensive, but it's so much better to, to buy peat free compost. Uh, like you were saying there about the peat bogs, that they, they act as a, a carbon sink and that these habitats have taken thousands of years to form to 
what we have now and that we're kind of digging them up for the peat to put in our in our compost um and as we dig them up then that's releasing carbon dioxide back into the the environment so we can do our little bit by where possible and as much as possible um buying peat free compost and you know speaking to our garden centers and where we're buying our plants and things like that as well uh you know it's kind of like consumer power absolutely yeah i can completely agree um so kate you also are of a project i understand on ponds and you're looking for a a bit of uh, in, in engagement in the- yeah so what i want to do is i want to create um a short video not very long minute maybe a little bit longer something than that um about why ponds are so good for wildlife maybe some top tips that type of thing uh but what i was hoping was that the the podcast listeners could maybe help me along my way and what i want to do is probably create this video out of still photographs a bit of a montage uh, so what i want the listeners to do is to send me pic- or on not me personally but on the be about facebook twitter social media is to send in their ponds it might be in their garden or they might have a, a pond in their uh, local community a village wider countryside um then then i can pick a certain few to help me create my videos so on our social media if they send in their photos and use the hashtag be about podcast and then we should be able to to find them and it doesn't matter how big or small their pond is if it is a small container pond that'd be fantastic because i want to kind of showcase the variety of different ponds and what's available out there that would be fantastic so thanks okay super okay well i'll 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 start and i i I will uh, post a photograph of uh, my own pond excellent thank you so i'll do that later so yeah well i think that's it for today so look thanks for listening everyone um if you would like to share your uh, photographs of your pond with kate if you've got any comments on uh, this week's episode or any questions inspired by the topics we discuss then please get in touch with us uh, so via uh, one of the social media channels facebook twitter use the hashtag be podcast we look forward to hearing from you enjoy your week and hopefully we'll see you next time thanks very much you have been listening to the be about podcast we hope you enjoyed it for more information about your local wildlife trust and how to join us please visit www.bbowt.org.uk